Welcome to the Movie Goer Society podcast brought to you by Nerdtropolis. I'm your host, Sean Tajapur, the mayor of Nerdtropolis. And joining me once again is my co-host, Drew Munhausen, the professional media and movie mastermind who has found himself in the middle of a Godzilla rampage. And I hope you're doing OK. I mean, is alarms blaring? Are you in a safe place? Are you, um, you know, kind of like a tornado? They say, what, go into a bathroom or a bathtub? I don't know what they say. But yeah, find find a windowless room and, <laughs> and you know, duck for cover. Yeah, I guess that's all I can do. I, I made this Godzilla background. It's really busy and he takes up the whole screen and he's kind of scary. But yeah, he I brought him along with me for the ride today. Yeah, that is uh, super terrifying. But before we get into all of that, we want to make sure you can connect with us online. You can find uh, myself and Nertropolis on every social media platform. Follow me at Sean Taj and then follow Nertropolis at Nertropolis. And don't forget to visit Nertropolis.com for your daily dose of movie news, reviews, interviews, and trailers. And Drew, where can they find you when you're not contributing to Nertropolis? You can find me at Drew Munhausen on all the different social media platforms. And then weekly over at Fresh Out the Podcast talking about Movies, TV show, video games, etc. Yeah, in this podcast specifically, we dive into the world of cinema, exploring everything from beloved classics to the latest blockbusters. And yeah, we're on episode 21, Drew. So what we're going to do, we're going to stop by Candy Cane Lane first before we head to battle that Godzilla. And I'm going to save you from Godzilla is what we're going to do. <laughs> Seems appropriate that our podcast has reached its drinking age of 21. And we're talking about a uh, family friendly holiday film in uh, in honor of that. Yeah, I, I love it. And also, don't forget to catch up on past episodes of the Movie Goer Society and tune into my podcast, Nertropolis Mayor Presents, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and the Nertropolis YouTube channel. And, you know, we're going to talk about Candy Cane Lane like right now, but I want to still want to make sure that you go visit our YouTube channel for my new interview I just did with the director. Actually, no, my apologies. It's not on YouTube. I actually did it differently because we had some audio format issues. But if you go on nerdtropolis.com you can actually read the entire transcript from our interview with the director of candy cane lane but it's really good stuff um before we get into the actual film itself it is directed by reggie hudlin who you know from um actually he did the og house party movie which is one of my favorites he also dived into the world of comics and gave us the black panther storyline where he he marries storm and also he is part of Milestone Comics, and I got to ask him about Static Shock, one of my favorite combo characters, and when we can see a Static Shock live action movie, which they are trying to push. But Reggie Hudlin, the director of Candy Cane Lane, has done so much television, movie, comics. He is a nerd, everybody. This is why I loved chatting with him, and I wish we had a full video to show you for that. But the transcript from the interview is actually fantastic, but um, he's definitely one of us. Drew, are you a House Party fan? I honestly haven't seen it oh. haven't seen it i know this might be blasphemy that's okay but this is what the podcast is for because i think if we do a classic episode we've talked about many different ones we haven't dived into classics that much yet but a busy busy year already for big blockbusters and other films we should do a house party uh viewing i will and is house party the one that they remade they did the the new one this year yeah, we don't want to talk about that much, but yeah, they, they, they did remake it. Oh, but yeah, it's, it's not too good. Close. Oh, it's no. nowhere close to the OG house party with Kid and Play and Martin Lawrence and a wonderful other cast members in there. I absolutely loved it. But uh, Drew, Candy Cane Lane, this is something, you know, that it's actually a very surprising film to me. It is a film that stars Eddie Murphy. It's a holiday comedy adventure about a man on a mission to win his neighborhood annual Christmas home decoration contest. And after Eddie Murphy's character, Chris, makes a deal with a mischievous elf named Pepper, played by Jillian Bell, which I actually love that. And we'll get into that. Uh, she actually casts a magic spell that brings the 12 days of Christmas to life and wreaks havoc on the whole town, uh, ruining the holidays for this family. And uh, I actually thought this was really fun. It's not a movie that would you wouldn't want to see on a big screen. It felt like a big, high-budget TV film, which is not a bad thing, especially with the holidays around. It really felt like something that would make its debut on television, and it's now streaming on Prime Video. And it stars Eddie Murphy, who reunites with Reggie Hudlin. They did um, Boomerang together. And I just thought it was a very heartwarming, very family-friendly film with a lot of flair. And to be honest, it looked really, really good. Uh, for the type of film it was, I thought the effects and the decor and everything on that was amazing. I told Reggie this is probably the most Christmassy Christmas movie I've seen in a long time based <laughs> on the visuals that we're getting. It's like 
some fantastic things that I I saw when it came to decorations. I wanted to steal some of that stuff. And he said he took some of that home with him uh, to decorate for the holidays. Some pretty cool sets and designs. And um, you have Jillian Bell as this mischievous elf. And uh, really a, a naughty elf. Let's let's admit that, Drew, right? <laughs> a very naughty elf. But what yeah, she's a naughty of- elf here, and we just saw her as a villainous character in Good Burger 2. So she's been she's been all over the place. Exactly my point. Yeah, exactly. She is so good at this, and she's really having a lot of fun. And I felt like everyone in this film had a lot of fun just bringing Candy Cane Lane to life. In the in the city of uh, Los Angeles, right? It's like the, not the most uh, winterish. It's not a winterish location, but they definitely brought Christmas to life in this film, and a lot of attention to to detail. So I really did enjoy it. I I liked the cast. I thought it was really good. A lot of fun moments, and Tracy Ellis Ross and Eddie Murphy I thought were really good on there. But it's a I highly recommend this one. You know, if you're looking for something at home to watch. Uh, I'm, I'm like a little bit more middle of the road with it. Um, I did think it was fun. So my thing with this movie is like, it, it, it takes its time kind of getting started, but when it gets into the, to the main plot, which is, which involves Eddie Murphy's character buying this huge Christmas tree that like unleashes the 12 right. and days how much of he Christmas bought this thing for like $490, which is a steal. I actually looked at that receipt. <laughs> I stopped us. It's a big tin can that he fits on top of his car. And inside of it is this like really high tech, massive tree for $493. You can barely get a regular tree with no lights on it for that much. <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny. But when it unleashes this 12 days of Christmas, I was like, I was kind of digging it. I'm like, oh, we're basically getting Jumanji Christmas is kind of the vibes of it. Um, But I just feel like it kind of the characters were good and the setting was good. And then they they introduced that premise. And then I feel like it kind of fumbled that premise a little bit. And it focused too much on like. Not that it's bad. I mean, it's a Christmas movie. You want to focus on family, but it was a lot about the family dynamics and like the 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 Christmas lights war. And there's like just so many different things going on. And I would have just liked to focus on the kind of Jumanji aspect of it and the, and collecting these rings and and um you know putting everything back at peace. I feel like the it takes its time and the first hour and a half is like pretty drawn out. And then the last like 25 minutes is boom, 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 boom. Cause you have to resolve everything. Um, that being said, the movie looked good. Eddie Murphy, you know, is in kind of classic Eddie Murphy form here. And Eddie Murphy just has a really interesting career because, you know, back in the nineties and, and two thousands, early two thousands, he, you know, every year you were getting some sort of Eddie Murphy comedy, um, usually of of varying quality, you know. And then um, in the early 2010s, he kind of took a hiatus and he didn't make any movies for a few years or, or only made a few uh, and kind of made a comeback with Dolomite is my name in, in 2019. And then we had coming to America and and you people and Candy Cane Lane feels much more in the realm of like the Eddie Murphy comedy of years past that like that we're used to. And it was kind of comforting in a way, seeing him get back to to that version of Eddie Murphy um, because his comedic timing and his presence is 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 still on point and he's aged so well. Like (laughs) he looks exactly the same as he did 20 years ago in comedies. So it's pretty crazy. Uh, But yeah, I I thought it was fun enough. And especially for a streaming Christmas movie that's now available for everybody. There's a lot of schlock that gets released at at Christmas time on, on Netflix and such that's, that's not of as of good a quality. And this one is, is better than a lot of those. So I I think that there's a lot of fun to be had here. It just kind of tries to deal with a lot of different Christmas themes and, and some of them work and some of them less so, but overall I had a good time with it. Yeah. I like that. You mentioned the Jumanji premise, which actually would have been awesome if they went full on. And there could have been many reasons why they didn't do it. You also have a family with three other kids. And so that takes a lot of away from that as well. And you add a lot of other characters. Um, But yeah, what they, it could have gone the way we kind of wished it did and would have been a blowout of film because there's also all these like sprinkles of really amazing stuff. And it, they put a lot of time also in the sets. If you look at it, especially um, the shop that the elf is in that um, 
what, what was the name of the mischievous pepper. Oh, pepper yeah pepper. pepper's shop was really cool and i liked the little glass figurines and that storyline was pretty cool and so that and that was really fun to see the little glass figurines come to life and adding another comedic um tone to the film and some fun stuff I was going to mention the figurines as well. That's a really memorable part of the movie. It could have been, you know, not memorable at all, but the way that they're animated and everything is really unique and, and well done. I thought, I thought they looked really good in the way that they moved. Um, I actually really liked the, the, uh, little glass characters, porcelain glass, whatever, whatever they're made of. Yeah. The, it's a very charming aspect of the film. And there's, I mean, I guess it's it's a secret or not a secret, but we do get the big man makes appearance. I won't say who it is because I do want to keep that a secret. But we do get the big man. And I was excited when that was the big man that showed up. Uh, <laughs> pretty cool. But yeah, it's just immerse us in the magic of Christmas in a in a sh really unique way. I haven't seen a Christmas film like this, you know, that wasn't full blown in theaters or anything like that. And I really loved it. And it seemed like they had a good time making it. And what the director Reggie said is him and Eddie really love Christmas. So that's how, you know, this all came about. And it's not really a spoiler, but this movie can continue with a sequel and spinoffs and a bunch of stuff the, the world they build actually works really well. Um, I really hope they do somehow capitalize on it and not make just a one-off. I think the casting is so strong, especially with Pepper the Elf and, everyone else and then the big man that ends up who act who's the actor for the the big guy that shows up and with eddie i think you can do a lot of fun stuff kind of not a santa claus route like the series on disney plus or anything but it's something that you can have a lot of fun with uh film wise or series wise and we need more stuff like this to be honest it's not that often we get holiday films that truly feel like it's a holiday film and the whole family enjoys it and has a good time they also bring back the classic uh credits bloopers for this one which i feel like i've seen kind of a resurgence of in some of the other streaming movies i've seen lately is you know the the bloopers during the credits which i'm all for typically as long as they're not overdone and you could tell on this movie based on the credits uh and the bloopers they showed that they were all having a good time yeah they were in this I, movie and i asked reggie about that too and he said they're having a blast and oh i didn't mention i actually love the soundtrack in this in this movie all the songs they picked out pretty um diverse and fun and have their place and i thought it was a pretty nice mix of festive soundtrack uh for this film a lot of things from here and there there is a weird bit of casting in this movie that i want to point out which is which is that nick offerman voices pip uh one of the glass figurines that we've mentioned and he's doing like kind of a classic charles dickens-esque like you know english accent a british accent and uh it's just very strange because nick offerman is you know not that and then he does you know we we see him in person briefly and it's kind of like why were you in this movie when you could they could have had like a british actor or something i don't think he even sounds like it, it, it doesn't even sound like the the, the accent anymore when he because i don't want to ruin anything but like it, when he's speaking and in his real self it doesn't really sound like the character he was playing as the glass figurine. It was kind of odd to me. I was like, did you I had the did exact you, same did you lose your accent? Yes. <laughs> I know exactly what you're saying. I'm like, God, he must have filmed this before he did the voiceover work because the accent has changed. Um, but yeah, but I mean, that's like a super nitpicky thing. I just I'm just interested to see what, what drew him to this project. And in this role, I thought it was interesting to have him. There. And he has but, to come uh, back um, on how this movie kind of concluded. And definitely he's around as well, which is that's that would be a fun component as well uh because that's towards a lot of fun stuff with him towards the end so yeah candy k lane is now streaming on prime video it is december is a perfect time to watch this movie and gather the whole family for this one and also make sure to go to troublous.com to check out my interview with the director reggie hudlin um uh, really really fun stuff really good cast and hopefully everyone has their tree up already <laughs> do you drew i do oh i had had mine up before thanksgiving and <laughs> yeah i'm one of those people there you go so but now i kind of want to check go into our second film and before we get into godzilla minus one we got some godzilla news at the same time and a couple other things first first off i watched up to episode eight of monarch legacy of monsters and i'm hoping the next two are available for us uh for critics to watch because episode eight left off on a big cliffhanger. Gonna just say that. And um, 
I'm not sure how far you got, Drew, but it's getting better and better, and it's getting a lot of fun. I haven't watched any of the new ones we've gotten, so I need to catch up on it. It's definitely a good time if you're a Monsterverse and Godzilla fan between that show currently airing this movie and uh, and I think the other trailer that you were alluding to. Yeah, so uh, before we get into that, the Monarch Legacy Monsters kind of jumps the shark a little bit, Drew. I'm going to tell you, like, I was surprised. It's like, oh, this is where we're going. Oh, um, okay. So I'm going to leave okay. it at that. It, it really picks up some steam and leaves off on, like, what they're going to do next. But yeah, this is part of the big monster verse that kicked off with Gareth Edwards' Godzilla. And so we had Godzilla King of the Monsters, and then we had Godzilla vs. Kong, and then you had Kong Skull Island. So we have a lot of movies that are part of this world. And they just dropped the trailer for Godzilla X Kong. I don't know what you call that. Um, the new Empire. Uh, <laughs> the Empire Strikes Yeah, I would, I, I would have said Godzilla <laughs> X Kong. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> why did i call it godzilla v kong kind of do like the superman <laughs> batman daughter justice type thing um very interesting trailer um very colorful very i don't know how to exp- very superhero like trailer of kong doing his thing godzilla around or coming out from somewhere and then introducing us to um king louis <laughs> monstrous king louis from the jungle book is uh <laughs> apparently making his way to the big screen in live action form and i'm not sure where this is going but it seems like where the last film left off and we saw a bunch of kong family members with their skulls you know on display as dead and decomposed maybe this guy has something to do with it it seems like i thought it looked okay i i not to jump too far ahead, but we'll talk about Godzilla minus one, um, which I had just seen. And so then I saw this trailer and I was just kind of like, oh, boy. Um, yeah, it's it's the the. Avengers ification of Godzilla and Kong and the monster verse. Like, I mean, I don't know. It's like the fast X of the Godzilla world. <laughs> yes, that's a, yes. Better comparison. <laughs> yeah, they. I don't know. I'm here for it. King Kong looks awesome. I would tell you that at least Godzilla. We'll see what his final design is going to look like. But that King Louis just looks ridiculous to me. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. It's, it's a little odd to see uh, King Louis. The, what is it? Orang- is he orangutan? Is that what that is? I, I believe so. Yeah. <laughs> um, going to face off. There has to be more to it. This not cannot be the whole movie. There has to be more to it. Kind of like how we had Mecha Godzilla in um the last one. And that was kind of that was kind of disappointing to me, the Mecha Godzilla stuff. I wish they would save that for like a for this movie, right? And just had a right. full, full-fledged um plot with that. So maybe we're gonna talk, let's get it to Godzilla minus one. I did not get a chance to see it, but Drew did. And before I let him take off, I'm gonna hopefully just say Drew. Maybe all of this needs to go back to Toho to really bring Godzilla, Hollywood Godzilla back. Because based on this trailer that we saw for the American Hollywood version, maybe this is not the way this franchise should go. And we should do what Godzilla Minus One hopefully delivers that. So, yeah. So first off, I kind of saw this on a total whim. I was actually planning to try and see Silent Night, the new John Woo movie uh, with Joel Kinnaman. Um, that's a Christmas theme moment, but it wasn't even showing at my local theater. And it seems like it it's it came it was released wide this weekend, but it's like it it's kind of hard to find it. And uh, but my local theater was showing this, and I had started to see I, I this really wasn't even on my radar, and I started to see really positive responses to it. And I was like, you know what? Um, not that I am a Godzilla scholar by any means. So I was like, I bet the Nerdtropolis audience is, is more interested in a Godzilla movie anyway. So I was like, I will check this out. Um, again, I'm not a Godzilla scholar. I have not seen all of the old Godzilla movies. I, I'm not the most well-versed. I've seen all the modern monster-verse things. And typically I go into it thinking, I'm not hard to please. If there's big monsters doing cool stuff, I will be happy. And then somehow those movies always still kind of leave me a little bit disappointed. Um, Godzilla minus one is a totally like kind of back to basics, no BS Godzilla origin movie. And it's awesome. Like it's really good. And I just, I, I wasn't expecting it. It, it, 
especially for the budget, what it was made for. The visual effects look pretty great considering. Um, and the plot is really good. And and you, you start with, you know, this is all taking place during World War Two. And there's a, a, a kamikaze pilot who, you know, he claims to have technical issues with his plane. And so he lands on this island. Uh, it's, you know, clear his plane might not actually have any issues, but he's kind of fleeing his duty. And while on this island, he gets his first encounter with Godzilla. And most of the uh, m- most of the military there are, are wiped out. And this one guy survives and ha- after this counter encounter with Godzilla, who's a uh, he's big, but Godzilla's not yet not quite ultra you know godzilla sized yet he's still growing and then um cut to a few years later and and a lot of tokyo has been devastated and and things because of the war and then uh we get more godzilla you get there's there's still all the characterization of the human humans and i think that they're actually a little bit more interesting than a lot of the movies that were getting made um you know for for american audiences this is you know a japanese made movie and once the godzilla set pieces you know uh, really start up they're great they're some of the best godzilla set pieces i've seen there's one that features a boat being chased by godzilla in the middle of the ocean and they're dropping mines and trying to to get godzilla and it's a really really cool set piece and the way that it ends and the the plans they come up with are just are fascinating and and Godzilla looks good and he looks intimidating, especially when he's in the water and he's like, it's his top half of his body sticking out or he's swimming on the surface when he gets out of the water and he's actually on, uh, you know, in Japan, he's still like a beefy chungus, you know, with his big old legs and body and kind of, you know, every now and then can look silly, but it's classic Godzilla. That's what we've always come to know and love. But yeah, I just, they did a good job of balancing good human story with really great Godzilla set pieces. And again, there's no, there's no BS here. There's not like, Oh, Godzilla is really good and trying to defend the people of Japan. And then he's going to fight these other monsters, like not to spoil anything, but like, no, this is, this is a Godzilla. Godzilla is the bad guy of this story. And it is the people trying to figure out how to deal with this giant radiation filled monster that's on their shores and uh i really enjoyed that about it D- this back to basics great cg uh awesome set pieces godzilla story and i was really caught off guard and as again i'm not a godzilla scholar haven't seen all the godzilla movies but of the ones that i have seen this is probably the best one i'd be willing to say that it's probably the best godzilla movie i have seen I've heard that from a bunch of people. It's getting great reviews. It's it's getting so much buzz. I mean, when this movie came out, my Facebook page was flooded, flooded with just positive reviews and just people like, y'all, you gotta go see this. It's so awesome. Yeah, you mentioned, you know, it's a $50 million movie, a very low budget, you know, really movie. And it's already made $34 million worldwide. And you're saying it looks that good. I think the budget for this one was $15 million. And, well, uh, yeah, and and talking about the box office, well, like I said, I was going to see Silent Night. Silent Night came in at ninth in the box office over the weekend domestic. It made only three million. Godzilla minus one came in number three, um, only behind Beyonce's new concert film and uh, the Hunger Games is is hanging out there still in the top three. So yeah, I I uh, I'm glad I made the right choice. This is clearly the movie that more people were interested in than uh, than a John Woo holiday movie. <laughs> So. Yeah, Godzilla always wins in the box office. I feel like I I don't think there's been a time where Godzilla just failed at the box office. It's just a, such an iconic pop culture character figure, whatever you want to call it. Been around a long time. Lions, I think that Silent Night's a Lionsgate movie. I haven't seen any pr- promotions for it. Uh, I don't think it even tested well, and uh, <laughs> I've heard some complaints about it too. <laughs> so uh, I think that's just about quality of film and what people want people already know what's what they're going to get so uh, people want more godzilla and so this is it this is i guess the ultimate godzilla film how's the sound how is godzilla sound in this is he pretty horrific his his roar yes i find, found him to be really intimidating and when he does his 
I don't know the right terminology. So Godzilla heads don't don't come at me. But you know when he shoots like his big the atomic blue like the beam. atomic breath almost type thing. The, yeah. yeah, the way that it looks when the spikes along his back kind of pop out in in preparation for shooting, uh, it just looks so cool and it's really intimidating. And the way he glows and the roar. And I I was able to see this in a Dolby theater, so the sound was incredible. It was loud. It was booming. It, it was a great experience. That's awesome and. You know, people are seeing this also in IMAX. I heard you can you can see this in IMAX. And then that scene that you just explained seems awesome that Godzilla's in the water and they're kind of getting him chased, chasing him or they're chasing. The, he's chasing the boat, but they're dropping these mines. I don't think we've seen like a battle with Godzilla in the water, per se, and, uh, other than like a, maybe a big ship because they're transporting Kong in those movies, but not like a cat and mouse game like this. It seems awesome. This is how you explained it. There are multiple big set pieces in this movie that take place in the ocean, and uh, it's all the better for it. Those scenes are really cool and leave you feeling like really isolated. And when he shows up and it's just a small boat in the middle of the ocean with a giant monster coming after you. Yeah, that's scary. Um, and, And it looks really good. And I think it's a way that helps with the CG, because the more you have Godzilla on the land and stomping buildings or in the, you know, in the middle of a field it looks a little bit cheesier whereas when he's coming out of the ocean it's it it was really scary looking i think that makes godzilla also smarter because i think he knows he's stronger in the water per se than on land he has more protection underneath and can hide better i mean if he's if he's just standing on the city he's not hiding he's not able to maneuver that fast you just said he had big chubby legs he always has uh he's not the track He's not a track guy, <laughs> you know, he's a, he's a Michael Phelps. Okay. <laughs> that's what he is. Right. And so that's pretty awesome that they're actually embracing and, and going back and kind of rewriting uh, Godzilla and really what his strengths are and what the movies were always about um, and making him, like you said, they made him the bad guy and uh, hopefully um, no spoilers drew, hopefully, but hopefully this is not a one and done film. Um, and maybe they can continue this and kind of just reboot the Godzilla for everybody, the whole world, you know, I know we have our version here, but this Toho version um, has always been good. A lot of the Toho stuff has been pretty solid and they've been really solid films, but this one seems to have knocked it out of the park. So I'm excited and hopefully I can find time to see it because it's all about time these days with the holidays, Drew. There's a lot of films coming out, but it's also Christmas time and you got to do a lot of other things as well. It's definitely tough. Um, but yeah, I, I will say they do... They do leave the door open for for more Godzilla from this world in the future. So very exciting. That, that is exciting. So I definitely have to I might have to go to theaters to watch this. I don't think I want to wait for I don't know how this is going to work streaming wise as it's a Toho film, um, but it is in theaters now. It just what opened up over the weekend, correct? Yes. And, and I'll say this about it, too. You know, this movie is 125 minutes, so a little over two hours. I'm always the first to wave my flag of like, eh, don't make your movies too long, shorter, better. This one, I feel like earns its two hour runtime. And I'll prep you with this. After the first Godzilla encounter, there is kind of a, a, a lengthy bit of learning the characters and sticking with the humans. And I started to think, oh, is this going to fall into the traditional trap of Godzilla movies where the complaint's going to be ah, too much people? I want Godzilla. And then right as you think that it's going to be too long on the people, it gets right back into the Godzilla action and then kind of never lets down. So it's 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 really solid. You got to pay your actors. You got to have them have screen time. <laughs> At least, you know, if you're going to have some actors. You can't make your um your cast have cameos, I guess. Is what it right. Is. <laughs> but your star is Godzilla. So, yeah, that's super exciting. So, yeah, there's two films for you right there. Uh, Kane and Kane Lane, Prime Video, Godzilla Minus One in theaters. Watch maybe on the biggest screen possible. It is a Godzilla film. And you're going to enjoy yourself with that, especially if you're a big fan. And, Drew, I mean, it's December... And I feel like there's still a million more movies to talk about before the end of the year. I mean, there's so much that we're going to have to cover and maybe we could have triple headers, quadruple headers. I don't, this is a rare thing to have a double header for this episode. The the good thing is luckily there's a few that we'll get to talk about in the future that I've already seen. So it's nice to have some checked off, get to see the boy and the heron tomorrow. And we can talk about that in the future. Um, but when you get to that week of Christmas like right before and after um there's going to be a lot a lot to catch up on um so hopefully I'll get to watch all everything that I want to I'm I'm excited for um Ferrari and a, and a new Michael Mann movie I, I Wonka's getting some actual good buzz I'm I'm 
kind of interested to see Wonka. You were you were relatively positive about it. Yeah, it, it, it's a good watch. Nothing like the original Wonka movie, but um, some really strong points in it. I will tell you this. I think we're going to have to talk about this little gem called Merry Little Batman coming to Prime Video. Um, so we definitely have to squeeze that in as well. We're talking about Iron Claw. We'll talk about Dream Scenario. I'm talk about the color purple. Um, I mean, there's just so much. What else is on your radar, Drew? I mean, we got Aquaman that we'll definitely I'll, be talking I'll, about. I'll talk about it soon, but it's it, for those interested in the Oscar buzz and and some of the foreign releases. I did get to see the Zone of Interest, which might interest some people. But um, man, that's a harrowing film. I'll talk about it more in detail. Um, we got the boy and the weeks. heron. Um, maybe I'll talk about poor things. I, I'll say it now. I couldn't watch the whole thing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so excited for poor things. Uh, I'll I'll be seeing that actually this weekend for sure. So okay, we'll, perfect. We'll add that and we'll talk that about on that. The radar. I, so that's where I'm at on, on that one for sure. Uh, and just a few more popping in and out that we'll definitely be talking about, but uh, a lot more. I think we my might daughter have... wants to see migration. Oh, that's right, migration. Uh, I I don't think yeah I don't think I'm gonna be able to watch that one when it comes out. Oh, there's just so much. It's hard to. Yeah, but Migration has a really good voice cast. I looked it up and I was actually surprised. Um, even Danny DeVito's in it. <laughs> and I don't know the last time I heard Danny DeVito uh, in an animated film, to be honest. They are showing that in front of Wish and Trolls and all the animated movies playing. So it's already on my my three-year-old's mind. And Migration, I think, it's a, so it's Illumination and they're going to have a like a short called Mooned, which is like a Minion short, I believe. Um, oh, she'll people. love that. She loves the minions. So, so yeah, again, people right in the early. seats trying to promote some minions because that's that's all that it's about. So a lot of good stuff, guys. So please keep up with us as we move on from episode 21. And if you haven't yet, check out our previous episodes of the Movie Goer Society and check out my podcast, Nertropolis Mayor Presents, where I interview directors and actors all on the Nertropolis Podcast Network. And once again, Drew, where can they find you? You can find me at Drew Munhausen on all the different social media platforms weekly over at Fresh Out the Podcast. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Thanks again for joining us for another episode of the Movie Girl Society. Once again, I'm Sean Chachwar, the mayor of Nertropolis, and we will see you at the movies. <laughs>